morning, and thank you so much for joining us for worship this morning. It is Mother's Day, so happy Mother's Day to you. Uh, I know that of all the holidays we experience in the year, Mother's Day is probably the most intensely emotional. We, we feel everything from celebration and joy uh, at the birth of new babies and, and new mothers, and we also, uh, many of us experience um, the grief of having lost a mother recently, and we feel those things with you, and we want you to know that we love you today, and uh, we're thinking about all of you, no matter where you might be in your situation as you think about your mothers. But I hope that the emotion that you feel more than anything else today is the emotion of joy, uh, joy for this wonderful gift that God has given us in mothers uh, I know for many of us, we would not be walking with the Lord today the way that we are if it had not been for the example of our mothers, for their prayers, for their persistence and their encouragement uh, in our lives. And so I hope that you feel joy today as you think about uh, your own mother and that as we worship today, you can give God thanks for her in your life. Uh, now, beside me, I wish you could smell what I smell right now. Normally, we uh, online, we've been using artificial flowers, but one of our church members uh, has given us these beautiful live flowers this morning to uh, beautify our, uh, our platform, and I'm so thankful for that, and what a special way for us to celebrate motherhood and Mother's Day today. As we begin our worship service this morning, I've invited one of my very favorite mothers, uh, my wife Carrie, to come and lead us with a call to worship and an opening prayer. So Carrie. Today our call to worship comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, verse 10, and then 25 through 31. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just come this morning um, with gratitude in our hearts. We're thankful for the gift of another beautiful day, Lord. We're thankful for a day set aside that we can honor our mothers and for all the women in our lives who have um, filled that role of mother and loved us and nurtured us and taken care of us and shown us the way, Lord. And we realize that all those women, all those things are gifts from you. God, we just um, thank you for your extravagant love. We thank you for the opportunity to still come together and worship you and um, praise you, Lord, even when we can't be together in person, God. Um, I pray that this worship service will just be an offering up to you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your presence and your work in our life. In your name we ask these things. Amen. Join us in worship this morning as we sing our new song, God So Loved. Two, three, four.
praise him, praise him for the wonders of his love. Praise God. His one and only Son to save. For God so loved the world that He gave us. His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated. Now Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world.
So we're continuing our series this morning on the subject of joy from the book of Philippians. And since it's Mother's Day, I've been asking myself this past week, what is it that brings joy to a Christian mother? I think that's an appropriate question for us to think about right now. You know, in Johnston County, uh, many times I've heard it said, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. So I think we need to ask ourselves this morning, what makes mama happy? It's a good question for us. Well, I'm not a mother, and so I have to use my imagination to be able to answer that question. And obviously, I've checked my, my thoughts with my wife to find out if I'm on target with these things. But you know, as a parent, I know what it feels like to hold your child in your arms for that first time. And especially in those first months of, of a baby's life, you look in, into their eyes and you just admire their beauty and you feel that sense of joy that you are a parent. And you start to ask yourself questions. What is this baby going to be like? How is he, how's he going to uh, live his life? Is he going to be successful? Who's he going to marry or who's she going to marry? And those questions begin to roll. And then you sometimes become a little bit overwhelmed. What am I supposed to do? Am, am I going to mess this up? Am I doing this right? What if I'm a bad parent? What if I can't handle this responsibility? And so then you start praying, God, help me not to mess this up. If I can just raise this child well and not make too many mistakes and, and that they can grow up to be a loving and mature and successful adult, then my joy will be complete. So there are different levels to the joy that we feel as a parent. The joy of having the child and then we look forward to the joy being complete when that child is mature and grown and successful and a loving adult. You know what I'm talking about? Now, if we were to dig down a little bit deeper into that and think about what are the most important things for us as parents and for you as mothers when you think about your children, what would make your joy complete? I think there are, are three things that come to my mind as we distill it all down. The first one, that they be loving, that they have good relationships. The second one, that they be mature, that they be people of of character, that all those things that you try to instill in them, that, that they begin to own those things for themselves and become people of, of character and integrity. And then thirdly, that they be successful, that they grow up to make a positive impact in the world. Well, I want us to keep those things in mind as we look at our focal passage this morning from Philippians chapter 2. We're hearing from Paul the Apostle, and Paul was certainly not a mother, but as I read this text, I think that it comes to us with the tone of a parent, a loving parent toward his children. You know, Paul had invested his life in the birthing of churches and, and new believers. Everywhere he went, he was telling people about Jesus, and new churches, new communities of faith were being born, and he loved them like his own children. And I think that is the case for this church in Philippi that he writes to in the book of Philippians. And Paul tells them, as we're going to read in just a minute in verse 2, here's how you can make my joy complete. Now, I think it's interesting that it seems to me that Paul's priorities for his church are very similar to the priorities that a mother has for her children. So Paul's joy is reflective of a mother's joy for her children. And ultimately, that points us, I think, to God's joy for us, His children, and His hopes for us that will, will bring Him the fullness of joy. Now today we're going to look at 18 verses, and there is a lot there. They're jam-packed, and so we're not going to have a chance to really unpack all that is in these verses from Philippians chapter 2. But what I hope to do today is to point out these three things in Paul's writing that we also see in mothers, and that as we would be able to, to think about those, we'll be able to commit ourselves to bringing God joy as we act out and work out those things in our own lives. Now let me give you a little bit of background uh, before we read the passage on this church. Remember, uh, in the past few weeks, we've looked at this church in Philippi, and Paul is writing to a church that is really under pressure. They're, they're experiencing persecution and hardship. And, and Paul knows that when the pressure's on, that creates real tensions in families and in relationships. And that pressure can cause relationships to become fractured. 
It can cause people to compromise their values. It can lead people who love each other to begin to argue and to complain and even to lose their effectiveness in the world, to lose sight of what they're really here for. Now, I've seen that in myself uh, over these past nine weeks of quarantine. When I'm under pressure, it's harder for me to have grace for myself. It's harder for me to have grace for others. I become more critical and and snappy and unkind and demanding and self-centered toward the people I work with, toward my family, and toward myself. The tension of life has a way of doing that to us. And so Paul, recognizing that that's the case, He begins to encourage this church that is under pressure by telling them first in chapter 1 how much he loves them, by reminding them that he is praying for them and that he believes in them. And then he reminds them of his own trials. Later on in chapter 1, he says, look at all the things that I'm going through and I want you to know that as bad as things look in my life, I believe that God is still working to advance His kingdom and to fulfill His purposes in me. And so I can have joy even though things aren't going well in my life. And then he transfers it to the church and he says, look, I know you're undergoing suffering as well. And I want you to know that God is going to work in your lives. Even despite your suffering, He's going to work through you. Just as God has used suffering for His good purpose in my life, He'll do the same thing for you. So be encouraged. And he says at the end of chapter 1 in verse 27, conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. And so as we begin chapter 2, we see him talking to this church as a parent speaks to a child. Paul's helping them to know what it looks like to conduct themselves in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. And so first we see how doing that has to do with good relationships, strong relationships with one another. And we see that in verses 1 through 4. If you'll follow along with me in Philippians chapter 2 beginning with verse 1, Paul says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if you have any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each one of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interests of others. As we read this, you see there there are four if-then statements, four parts uh, to what Paul is saying to the church. What's the relationship that God wants to see between his children the church, one another. It's the same that God, want, that God has shown us in the relationship between Christ and us. As Jesus said to his disciples, as I have loved you, so you should love one another. In John 13, 34. Just as I've poured out my love for you, I want you to love each other in the same way. And we see that in this if-then statement, in these four parallel statements from Paul. You might miss them if you don't look closely, so look in your Bibles and follow along with me as I I show you these four parallel statements. First he says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, then make my joy complete by being united or like-minded with one another. Secondly, if you have any comfort from Christ's love, then make my joy complete by having the same love for one another. If you have any fellowship, any commonness or oneness with the Spirit of God, then make my joy complete by being united, having fellowship and oneness with each other. And if you have tenderness and compassion from God, then make my joy complete by doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Don't always try to build yourself up and feed your own ego. Build others up. In verse 4, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. So because of what Christ has done for you, allow that to overflow into your relationships with unity and with love and connectedness and humility and compassion. You know the golden rule, don't you? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, this takes it a little bit, a little step further. 
It says, do unto others and treat others as you have been treated by God. Paul says, I want you to treat each other with the same love and compassion that you have received from Jesus. Now, can't you hear a mother saying that to her children? I wish you would just get along with your brothers and sisters. It makes me happy when you get along. I love you all so much and it hurts me when you hurt your brother. It hurts me when you hurt your sister. Do you think it gives God joy to see one of his children stepping over another one of his children or hurting another one of his children in order to advance themselves? God says to us, make my joy complete by loving each other and treating each other the same way that I have loved and treated you. The church is a family. And we bring God joy when we love one another and have good relationships. Well, now Paul begins to build on that idea in verses 5 to 13. And we see the example of Jesus that he wants us to follow. Read along with me, beginning with verse 5. Paul says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Here's your example. Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, even to death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Now, this is a packed set of verses. This is a great theological description of Jesus. These, these verses are known as the hymn of Christ. And it has been a source of theological reflection and, and debate for centuries but most simply, what we have here is the example of Jesus Christ for us. His example for Christians in helping, de helping to develop godly, Christ-like character. Your attitude should be like the attitude of Christ. What is Christian character? It's looking like Jesus. And what was Jesus like? We find in these verses that, that he was humble, that, that he emptied himself that he was sacrificial. He didn't grasp at position or power or authority or comfort or ease. Instead, he became obedient to God, even to death on a cross. Jesus didn't insist on having control. He surrendered control to his heavenly Father. And because he did that, God exalted him to a place of glory and joy. What a picture of, of godly character for us. The person who's like Jesus doesn't grasp at power and control and authority and self. The person who has godly Christian character is one who selflessly and willingly serves. And isn't really that a picture of a godly mother? Paul says this is how you should be, like Christ. Your character should mirror his character in service to others. And so we see the obedience of Christ there in in verse 8, that Christ was obedient to his Father. Now if you look down at verse 12, Paul says, Now you, my friends, as you have always obeyed, there's the obedience that comes from the church. As you have always obeyed, he says, not only when I was there, but even now that I'm not there with you. And isn't that the test of, of true character? That you do the right thing and that it, you exemplify character even when nobody's watching? You know, as a parent, don't we want to know that our children are going to, to live according to our values, whether we are with them and watching them or, or not? We want to know that they've owned those values and that those things live on in their lives. Well, Paul says, that's how it has been with you. And let it continue to be that way as you work out your salvation. 
Now that idea of working out our salvation is not about earning our salvation. It's about living into or living out what God has already done in us. It's about receiving God's grace and allowing God's grace to work in us. In fact, he says, it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. It's the idea of us working out what God has worked into us. It's in a partnership of obedience with God and his grace. And so there's, there's joy for God in our good relationships with one another, his children. There's joy for God as we begin to exemplify godly, Christ-like character. And ultimately, Paul says that leads to a third fulfillment of joy, the joy of impact, of making a difference, a fulfillment of purpose. And we see that in verses 14 through 16. Paul says, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. What's the result of a life of integrity and godly character? Love for others? That life shines. It stands out against a backdrop of darkness and brokenness and hurt in this world. That kind of life shines like a light. Robert Morgan said there are two kinds of Christians. One that whines and one that shines. That's the case for Christian lives and that's the case for churches as well. A church that argues and complains and is in dispute with one another is a poor witness for Christ. We look just like the rest of the world. But when a church or when a Christian is unified and loving and godly in character, it becomes a powerful witness to the world. It shines like a star in the universe. You know, we parents are funny creatures, aren't we? We will invest amazing amounts of money and time and resources in giving our children dance lessons or gymnastics lessons or batting practice or putting them on the very best team or, or sending them to drama camps. And it starts all the way in preschool. We do it with our youngest children and goes all the way through college and probably even into adulthood. We work with our children for weeks. We invest money in costumes and, and practices and we work with them on their lines or we work with them on their form just to make sure things are perfect. Preparing and rehearsing for the performance that is to come. And then when performance time comes, we buy tickets so that we can go and watch them do what they've been preparing to do. And we sit there in our seats with our cameras ready. We're poised, ready, ready. Not for all those other kids to come out on stage or to come out on the field, but because, but because we want to see our child. And when they come out and when they do their part, when they, when they say their line, when they do their twirl on the stage, we beam with joy. We take pictures of them and we post them on Facebook. And we say, that's my son. That's my daughter. And we are filled with joy as we see our children fulfilling all this that we have worked to accomplish in their lives. And we think in those moments, all the hours and all the money and all the dedication and the work that we've put into practicing and preparing them, boy, it's all worth it, isn't it? When we see them perform and when we see them do well, we'd say it's worth all the sacrifice that I've made in order to see that happen. That is a mother's joy. Well, that's Paul's joy as he thinks about his church, his spiritual offspring, he thinks about his own sacrifice and his suffering on their behalf. And he says, if you can be mature and complete and have good relationships and make a difference in the world and, and hold out the word of the gospel in a beautiful way, then it is all worth it. It's worth whatever it cost me that you have godly character and that your lives make a difference. And that gives me reason to rejoice. That's the joy of God. When he sees our love for one another, when he sees our character and our faithful obedience and sacrifice and holiness and purity and serving him without complaining or arguing, 
when he sees the way we live that holds out the gospel, God looks at us and he sees his son, his son whom he loves living in us and living through us. And he rejoices that his sacrifice was worth it because his son lives in us and his joy is made complete. Very simply this morning, I want to ask you, when God sees you, does he see his son? Have you been born again? Has Christ been born in you by faith? Have you received him into your life as your Lord and your Savior? If Christ is in you, is it bearing itself out in your relationships Are you letting the love and the gift of God's grace through Jesus to overflow from you into the relationships of other people in your life? Are you putting your selfish interest above others? Or are you following the example of Christ being sacrificial and loving on their behalf? How are your relationships today? Maybe there's a relationship that you need to bring some correction to today. Maybe there's someone that you've been far from, someone that you haven't encouraged or lifted up or loved in some way. Today would be a great day to bring joy by loving them and letting Christ live in you. How's your character? Is there an area of disobedience in your life today? Maybe it's living in blatant disregard for God's ways Or maybe it's just neglecting something that you know he wants you to do. Today may be a good day for you to humble yourself before him and surrender to God and to allow the grace that God has given you to be worked out in your own character, in the holiness of your actions. How is your influence today? Does your life shine? Are you making a difference in the world? Or is your good witness being covered up by arguing and complaining? Have you hidden the gospel of your life under a basket so that no one can see Jesus in you? Maybe today is a good day for you to come out from hiding, to hold forth the word of life with joy and to fulfill the purpose that God has given you in Christ. (laughs) You know, all those things are what makes a mama happy. But more than that, those are the things that makes our Heavenly Father happy. That when He sees us, He looks at His Son and He says it was all worth it because Christ lives in them. Would you bow with me for prayer? Father, we thank You for all that You have done for us and in us. Lord, we thank you that it gives you joy when we surrender ourselves to you and are born again in Christ. That you have joy in the life that you have created in us. We thank you, God, for the potential and for the purpose that you have worked in us through Christ. And I pray that you would help us, Lord, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling and submission to you. Help us to do it in our relationships. Help us to do it in the character of our lives. Help us to do it without arguing or complaining or whining. But Lord, to surrender ourselves with joy so that we might live out and hold out the word of truth, the word of the gospel, and that Christ might be glorified and that your joy might be made complete in us. Help us, Lord, to do that. By saying yes to you today, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and
Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood. Thank you again for joining us this morning for worship. I hope and trust that the Lord has blessed you through our time together. I know that you are all aware that in the past week, the governor has begun to reopen our state uh, with phase one. And that means that churches can begin gathering together at some capacity. So I want you to know that our, our leadership is discussing and planning and working on a way for us to regather as soon as possible that it is safe and responsible and uh, we are excited about getting to back together with you. Our current plan is to be back together on May 24th in one capacity or another. In the next week, we'll be in touch with you to let you know of our plans and to get your feedback. So make sure if you're not already subscribed to our email list that you go to the website mmbc.life and subscribe so that you can be up to date on our plans. And we look forward to meeting with you soon. In the meantime, so many people have told me how God has worked in their lives and blessed them even through this time. And so I encourage you to stay close with your families, continue to draw close to the Lord, and to reap the benefits of this time of unusual circumstances. Let God work in your life and draw Him close to you and to your family until we're able to meet again. Our benediction today again is from Philippians chapter 1. And this is my prayer for you, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen.